All right, cool. We'll go with the first run at this, and we'll see how this intro rolls. Perfect. All right, three, two, and one. All right, I'm here with our guest, Chase Phelps, the Director of Sports Science at Stanford University. Chase has an amazing background, and I was fortunate enough to work underneath him at Stanford. Chase is more than versatile. He has a deep understanding in regards to human physiology, but also the technology involved in monitoring athletes and performance in general. So Chase, I'll let you take it away here and uh, kind of talk a little bit about yourself and the journey that you took to get to where you are. I personally have heard it um, multiple times. It's quite interesting. And uh, for those listeners out there, it's going to be a good experience to hear exactly how someone of Chase's uh, esteem got to where he is and how the road's not always quite a straight line. Hmm. Well, uh, I appreciate you having me on. I, I, you must be getting the checks in the mail to have that type of intro because uh, that's way, way over the top on uh, how good I am on my job, but I appreciate it. Um, so I think for me, you know, it started, I think for a lot of us being in the gym as an athlete, um, you know, kind of being one of those guys who's got to work harder to, to, you know, catch up with the other people who are kind of naturally talented. So uh, I started off as a, your general meathead in the gym in high school doing all the dumb uh flat bench, incline bench, decline bench, pec deck into, you know, all the flies you can do and, and kind of started to figure out that uh, I needed, you know, a more scientific way, I guess, to, to train myself and, and started out going to a velocity sports performance and, you know, one of those big kind of box performance gyms and got hooked up, some, really, really lucky, got hooked up with some people who uh, at the time I didn't know were, were ahead of the game, but uh, kind of started giving me the whys behind you know, all the things I was doing in the gym and started kind of carving that path for um, laying the foundation, so to say. So I went to undergrad, played the cross in college um, and did the exercise science piece, started the internships to be a traditional SNC coach on the floor. Um, uh, did, let's see, Old Dominion, Radford, um, Virginia Tech, uh, IMG Performance, um, you know, just kind of laying the the coaching trenches, laying down in the trenches and trying to, to kind of get myself uh, the experience necessary to, to move ahead as, as a traditional SNC coach. Um, so I got really lucky in that I, I got a job at Hampton University as an assistant. And within about seven months of being there, the uh, director at the time up and left and uh, they had nobody to help out with football. I got to take over and really at an age that was way too young for me to, to be in that role. and. Um, so that was kind of my first, you know, trial by fire experience being 23 years old, heading up a, you know, it was a one double A football program, but still a division one football team where, you know, I, I was pretty, pretty novice at the time. And, and while I didn't mess anything up too bad, it was uh, definitely, I would change a lot of what I did at the time. So I, I look back on that experience that it was extremely valuable, but um, from there, I actually had a stint where I was unemployed. So uh, a little life lesson is I took somebody's word on a job without having it written out and quit my job at Hampton thinking I had this uh, position set up and, and literally it fell through. The guy was like, hey, listen, it's not going to happen. I don't know what to tell you. I'm really sorry. So for seven months, I worked at local gyms, private uh, personal training, training athletes on the side, just basically doing anything I needed to do to, to ma maintain coaching, but also to, to keep an income going. Uh, and it's kind of funny because a lot of people don't appreciate that type of setting in the, in the personal training. You're either a strength coach. It's not personal training, you know, and uh, a lot of the stuff that I do now, uh, I still, you know, I remember picking up because I was working with a client with rheumatoid arthritis. Right. So like your ability to, to regress and appropriately choose exercise selections uh, for somebody who's 60 years old and, and is not very mobile translates very well to return to play in an athlete who just had maybe a, an ACL surgery. Um, and so I look back on that time, it's kind of a weird one in my life, but it was extremely valuable, you know, in my experiences. So I got really lucky um, and kind of the networking piece fell together and ended up working with uh, Naval Special Operations um, and, and kind of finding a role in the human performance branch there, um, where I was there for a little over three years. I was just incredibly lucky to work with some of the people there, Mark Stevenson and, and a lot of other guys who are still working there. Um, they're still there now, but they're just, they're pushing the field forward. 
uh, doing a lot of things behind the scenes that I think really kind of kicked off the sports science kick in the, in the U.S. in the last, you know, six to eight years. Um, and so I was really fortunate to kind of diversify my experiences there, really start looking at performance and, and training. Uh, I don't want to say like that buzzword of holistic, but just how am I diversifying my ability to understand what each discipline's doing, whether it's a mental performance coach, uh, our, our nutritionist, our, psych- um, our, our physical therapist, um, but how can I better understand those fields to then you know, make sure that everything I'm doing is complementing what they're doing. Um, and so I was um, able to, to land the job at Stanford uh, initially just to run the sports science department. Um, but I also got a uh, little coaching duties on the side as I work with men's soccer. So it's been, uh, it's been a, all over the place, you know, traditionally in athletics, but, you know, a little bit of gen pop here on the side as well. So um, Chase Bashfully passed over his lacrosse career right and how many was it multi-time all-american is that correct uh um, i i had a, a couple of years where i was pretty successful so uh and i think that's extremely important to highlight because being an athlete you deal with all these departments firsthand you see it from their perspective and so one thing that chase has really taught me is going forward is learning about how you continue to challenge yourself to put yourself into positions that other people are in and how do you then think about your actions and what you're going to do as a sports scientist in regards to how it not only influences the athlete but the coaches and the other staff around them and being an athlete you firsthand get to experience how it is to have someone else trying to intervene on your daily routine and not to also mention that chase is now uh, someone who i don't know what level of jujitsu he's in but i know he's tough enough to beat the daylights out of me and that's something as well he's taught me is that put yourself in situations where you have to be a beginner again and challenge yourself to have to learn from square one. We get caught in these ruts of progress, progress, progress. You go from a beginner where you first learn how to swing a baseball bat to now you're playing um, you know, higher level traveling baseball and it's part of your life or for myself, basketball. What Chase has taught me is really embrace those opportunities of struggle and whatever way that comes in its shape and form and put you in those positions so you have the ability to actively learn from that. And now mentioning that, Chase, in regards to being an athlete, I think there's many things that we overlook. As coaches, we apply the idea of an external load, right? We give them sets and reps and weights and we write out these long workouts for the next six months of what someone's going to do, but we can't predict the internal load. And being an athlete, you understand how it is to not sleep how it is to maybe stay out a little too late with some of your friends, but how that affects you um, in regards to an athletic setting to reach the goals that you want to reach. So I want to dive into the topic a little bit about internal versus external load. That's yep. something that you really challenged myself to learn about when I was with you. We talked about that in regards to HRV, sleep, and all the above. So I want to hear a little bit about your take on internal versus external load. What specifically is external? touch on what you said as being an athlete uh i think that goes you know it's 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 almost like every year that you are in the field you separate yourself from what it feels like to go through the workouts and the daily grind so to say right it's really easy to write up a card and have no uh thought process about how somebody feels on day six of a week where they've been pulling all day school uh two and a half hour three hour practice hour weights and you're like, oh man, we got a great dynamic effort lower body session finished off with some, you know, BFR lower body squats. But like, you know, it's it's just really easy to forget how um, how things can accumulate and, and how you know you're just trying to kind of at times get through it all and, and keep your head above water. Whereas we're thinking about optimizing, where they may be thinking about, hey, I just need to you know put my head down and, and get through today. Um, so I think that was a great point. But I think going on to the external load piece. Obviously, the U.S. in the last, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years has exploded, uh, trying to catch up maybe with Australia and the Europe, so the world have been um, really kind of on the forefront of this uh, objective collection of, of needs analysis for sport, you know, whether that's an external load of what they're doing, the mechanical uh, demands of the sport, so how far they're running, 
um, what are the, the physical characteristics that you see, the biomotor capabilities, as in, um, you know, speeds, what velocities are they typically going to run? How many uh, times are they going to change direction? Uh, really kind of understanding the demands of the sport um, versus the internal loading piece, which you're going to be, how are these uh, individuals responding to those demands? And I think the key word there being individual, we, we know that certain athletes are always going to be uh, pushed and filtered into sports that they're uh, naturally good at, right? Like, I think we all tend to favor things that we've been successful at. And as we kind of go up through our broken physical education system, uh, we haven't done a really good job, I think, in our country of kind of diversifying and scaling appropriate levels uh, to make sure people are developing in, in multiple ways. We kind of just like, oh, you're good at the sport. Keep at it. You suck. You're out. Um, and I think if we were to kind of cater developmental, developmentally appropriate um, skill acquisition techniques, and I'm just stealing all this from a, a classmate of mine, Peter Burden, so you'd be proud, I think. Uh, but if we were to do a, a better job of scaling, you know, developmental levels, I think you would see more athletes come out of that that would be successful instead of just being like, oh, I'm the tall guy, put them under the basket. Um, you know, you would be able to develop more skills. But back to the internal load piece uh, and understanding that, like, I work with men's soccer. Uh, Max, we were talking about this maybe a year ago. I have a guy who uh, logged 20,000 meters in a playoff game last year. You know, that's over 12 and a half miles you know, in one game. And he had played a game two days earlier and had been practicing for four months. And it comes to the question of like, how does somebody do that? Do, they, do you train them to do that? Do they just uh, follow the program and all of a sudden they can do that? Or did their, I guess, internal demands to the sport over time, it took years, it took decades. And in my opinion, it took that athlete uh, to play the sport at a high level you know, for 10 plus years to be able to get that cardiac adaptation, that peripheral ability to be so efficient that they can run and change and cut and jump uh, at that intensity. And so an athlete like that, that, that internal load, you know, they're going to be very, very effective at mobilizing energy. They're going to be very good at providing blood and oxygen to the, to the outside of the body. <clears throat> Whereas, you know, you take, uh, not to hit on the sport, but like softball, that's a completely different athlete. And so if you were to ask them to have um, participate in similar demands, we know that internal load would be different. You're going to have an inefficiency that, um, you know, what I would call like a, maybe a struggle uh, to match the requirements of work or mechanical load that you're placing upon the athlete. So I think, you know, what's really important as you start to look at that internal versus external, the external is critical. I think uh, in a lot of uh, sports, we're just now identifying what is necessary uh, to be successful on the field as in what they're doing. So uh, you can start at that, you know, backwards design and work uh, your program to say, here's ultimately what they have to be able to do. This is a worst case scenario on the field. This is how we should uh, cater our return to play protocols so that we know we're working towards um, ultimately the ideal player in that sport. Um, and Interesting. Yeah. Um, not to cut you off, I just make some clarity here in regards to internal versus external load. When we talk about external load, we're talking about the amount of work someone actually does. Yes. Right. So the amount of weight being lifted, how fast someone's running, how many pages someone can read. Totally. Right. And yeah. in, re in regards to what is internal. It? Sorry, go ahead. It's really what is happening. What are you doing? What, how much of something? Something you're applying to the body. And then the internal load is the physiological changes that take place. And so the most basic concept is, hey, we're going to give you a weight program. We're going to lift X amount of weights for X amount of days with the external load intending to change the internal environment to grow muscle. Yep, and then absolutely. the more muscle you grow, the more internal load you can handle. So your adaptive capacity, that big bucket of how much you can handle in life, you become very efficient at handling that consistent external load and you increase your ability, whether it be efficiently or the magnitude and size of that bucket to handle a larger, um, I guess, external load in regards to having a larger internal capacity. And yeah. so what you're kind of talking about is when our bucket's very specific, say we're playing soccer and we change to, um, you know, let's say tennis or in your case, softball, you mentioned the softball 
player would struggle with soccer and the soccer player would struggle with tennis because those external loads are so different than the internal capabilities of that individual. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think the higher uh, level you go, you definitely see that specificity of coordinated uh, skills really kind of become, I guess, very niched. And what you typically say, and I actually kind of think it's funny because I've said it, so I'm guilty as charged, is that you'll look at a soccer player, you know, somebody who can play at the highest level and is sprinting, doing all these different, you know, athletic uh, exercises. And then we'll be like, man, they're a bad athlete. They can't skip. Or look at that squat pattern. It's <laughs> pattern terrible. And, you know, you kind of take a step back and you're like, well, was the goal to squat or is the goal to score goals and play soccer? Um, and then some, you know, may argue, well, you know, I had the longevity piece. Are they going to be, you know, more prone to injury, all that? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, and I think about that subconscious competence, when you put somebody in a gym and, and a, you know, a new environment where they may not have done these things, they're very aware. They're consciously incompetent. They're sitting there going, I suck at this. And they overthink it, right? And then you ask them to like go out on the field and, and kick a ball around and they're doing these things. They're changing direction, which is basically a squat with shin angles changed. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, yeah. they're doing these things fluently uh, without even thinking about it. So it's like their ability is there. It's just not in the right context. Interesting. Yeah. So you bring up the concept of someone being consciously aware, right? So my, they might be in a nervous kind of state. They're not familiar with the weight room. And that actually brings some level of anxiety possibly. Is that Absolutely. true? Yes. And that itself may make the weight room, instead of a, a stressor, which is something very positive, it might be a distressor. And so they see the weight room as negative. And so now they're nervous to work out and they have to work out, which makes the internal load even larger. Absolutely. So it makes this environment that kind of gets magnified. In regards to that, what other factors influence your internal load? Something you kind of mentioned was that stress. And obviously there are external stressors, especially at Stanford, we're very intelligent. Uh, students who are having to go through rigorous testing and schooling, and it's a very competitive environment, not just athletically, but um, kind of the education side as well. Do those stressors impact your internal load? And if it does, how does that influence the amount of external load as a coach you might provide? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's always going to be multifactorial. It's always going to be, it depends on who's, who's the athlete, what's their background and, and the sport or the, the activity you're asking them to do. Um, the, the daily life, the, the 22 hours that they're not with you, are they hydrated? Are they eating properly? Are they fueling for uh, adequate activity? Are they getting enough sleep? Are they, you know, have a test? Are there psychosocial factors at, at play? Like their girlfriend or boyfriend just broke up with them. And I think all those things, um, obviously have an impact. There's been a ton and ton of focus placed on this type of, uh, I guess, capturing that whole athlete. Whereas maybe, you know, years ago, you would look at tonnage and now people mm -hmm. want to look at tonnage and what that uh, stress load is, what that academic load is, because, you know, research is coming out now that we know that these types of overloaded stressors and stresses, the same stress that, you know, makes you resilient can break you down. So it's really the improper dosing and inability to cope with that load and that stress that creates the problems. But, um, you know, you look at uh, athletes who are um, an exam week like there's research talking about that people heal uh, less efficiently they have immune issues so you're seeing people get sick you're seeing that inability to adapt and cope with the demands that are placed on them being significantly altered by some other type of factor outside of a weight room or a field um, i think the the fact that the the collegiate environment is is being more aware to that and and teams are trying to you know, push practice in the morning a little later, or they're trying to, to manipulate schedules so that kids aren't just running straight from class, but they have a little time between to get some type of snack and to have some moment to, to themselves to take a couple breaths before they go out. Uh, and on the flip side, right after practice, are they running directly into a, you know, a test or something? Or are they actually able to have a little moment to themselves where they can kind of downregulate, take everything in and then move on? I think that those types of things, while are not massive, uh, are significant because they happen 10 to 20 times every day over the span of weeks and years. And that's really the problem is that chronic buildup of um, a overactivated sympathetic response that 
may be exacerbated by an athlete's type A, their personality, their type A personality of, hey, I'm driven, I'm a high performer, this is what I do, uh, or maybe some of the lifestyle stuff. So maybe that there's somebody who, you know, is just pumping refined sugars into their body and, and creating a flux in blood sugar regulation that, again, mobilizes cortisol, a sympathetic response. And, and next thing you know, you've just in the span of three hours, tagged on six different things, albeit slightly different, that had the same outcome on the system. So that internal response becomes very, very sensitive to everything you're doing because it's that chronic buildup that's really taking its toll on it. Interesting. So you bring up the idea of the sympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system being broken down, um, I guess being partnered with, I should say, with the parasympathetic nervous system, right? And that makes up your autonomic nervous system. So for those of you not familiar, sympathetic nervous systems, your fight or flight, it mobilizes energy. It's looked at to be very important for survival. If we saw a lion during evolutionary times, it would help us increase our heart rate, increase oxygen supply, mobilize energy so we could run away from a lion. But then we'd have the parasympathetic aspect, that branch would help regulate rest and digest, and kind of the repair and rebuild process. Now with that, you mentioned the hyperactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. Now, does this get out of whack sometimes if you're an athlete, you're an individual, where you're chronically stressed? And if so, does that affect some of your endocrinology, so how your body responds? And what kind of tips can you have, you know, you use with your athletes or yourself to get yourself back into a parasympathetic state? Yeah, that's a great point. I think the, and not to, to correct you, I think what you're saying is absolutely right. I think that the key is, is not to, to constantly counteract sympathetic, but is to bring the body back into a more balanced ability to appropriately turn on sympathetic and to appropriately turn on parasympathetic. And what you typically see, and I said it, so I, I think you're totally right, is uh, sympathetic does become the primary driver, um, but it isn't all about just turning on sympathetic. It, it, it's, it's having the ability to use both when you need it. And I think a lot of times the door or the window to that is to drive parasympathetic activity on so that it can kind of restore itself. Uh, and then the goal, once you're kind of in ability where you have a little bit more of a stability in that, is then to have access to both. So, so I you think talked to me about, I don't mean to interrupt, Chase, but this is something that just reminded me completely, yeah. where if someone is chronically sympathetic, um, let's say they're in a game situation, this kind of goes back to that being stressed out. They might have um, hyperactivity, sympathetic nervous system, and correct me if I'm wrong, this decentralizes, sorry, desensitizes the frontal cortex and reduces some individual's ability to make decisions, especially when fatigue begins to set in because you have multiple um, areas of stress coming to the body, fatigue, the actual stress emotional of the situation, and then the person's internal ability to regulate that. That's something you had talked to me about and spoken with me about while at Stanford, and I found that topic to be extremely interesting, and due to the fact that it's completely universal. Whether you're an athlete or you're an individual going in for a job interview, they kind of fall under the same umbrella. Is this the case? Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. So I think ultimately it's a fine line, right? So I think the sympathetic nervous system actually has been shown to, to enhance some um, cognitive activities, right? So it does increase that acute um, ability to, to recall some information. And at the same time, an overdriven response of it can almost shut everything down. And that's where you see people kind of like getting up, hyperventilating, and not being able to perform and, and really kind of um, altering some type of uh, a thoughtful, logical, rational um, action. So I think it comes down to two primary things. It's a primary and secondary appraisal. And this is a psychology-based concept, but I think it applies basically to everything in, in performance and in primary, the athlete, the person, whoever is going to say what is happening. And this is subconscious um, and happening in different aspects of the brain, the amygdala and the hypothalamus, but your body goes, what's, what is this? Right? So I look at the analogy of you walk into a bar, all right, you scan the bar, you have a very, very fast uh, action, or I'm sorry, excuse me, decision about what is in that bar. Is it a threat? Do you see a bunch of Hell's Angels with guns and, you know, baseball bats sitting there? Or do you see a bunch of friends, right? So, and then it's that same split second, a secondary appraisal happens to the primary. That secondary being, do I have the resources to cope with this? 
And that is really what dictates what type of response the ANS is going to send uh, or the brain will send to the body to stimulate what side of the, the autonomic nervous system, right? So if I walk in, I say, what? I don't like this too. Hey, I've been in this scenario before. It didn't go well. That's when that sympathetic's going to kick on because I got to get out of here. Versus I walk into that same place. It's a bunch of friends. You know, it's my old buddy from college. You're going to have a completely different mobilization of neurotransmitters, of hormones, uh, because of your perception of the stressor is, is completely different. And you mentioned you stress distress. And I think that that's the, the case for everything because uh, not to go on a rant, but if you, if you take an athlete who loves running, that stress of running is completely different than an athlete who doesn't like running, right? So their perception of an activity, albeit the same activity, will have a different psychophysiological um, manifestation of stress or load on the body. And so I think as we talk about mental toughness with our athletes and all of that, ultimately comes down to, have you put them in situ situations to prepare them to have confidence in them? And that's what's going to dictate some of these positive body responses that you'll see because they'll walk up to that play and go, yep, done this a million times. And that is where you kind of have that, that mental res resilience versus I don't know what's going to happen. I've never done this before. If I miss, it's going to be the game. Uh, and I think when we talk about all of performance and psychology and, and physiology, it's so intertwined. You cannot separate them. And we like to separate things. We like to have absolutes. We like to wear a monitor on our wrist or our chest that tells us we're tired or that tells us we've been too stressed. But the reality is, is that the individual differences in perception of stress and my ability, my body's ability to adapt to that stress um, based on what type of in internal environment is, is kind of walking around 24 hours a day is going to dictate everything. And that's why it's really tough in a, in a team environment for us to just blast everybody and say, we're going to stress. Um, you know, we're going to do internal load monitoring via HRV. Well, that's fantastic. And I think there's, there's merit to that. So I'm not saying there isn't, but you better make sure you know a lot about your athletes. You better make sure you have the time to learn about their personalities, how they handle things, what type of family experiences they've had, what type of things go into them making decisions about what they're experiencing. Gotcha. So uh, that's, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, that's, beautifully said one of the things you mentioned there was the idea of hrv but also the idea of perception so hrv being a reflection of the autonomic nervous system and compared to your own baseline when your hrv numbers lower it means you have less variability which essentially is inferring a higher level of sympathetic drive and when your hrv is higher it infers a more balanced state or a more parasympathetic state or essentially less sympathetic Right. Right. And so we start using HRV and we talk about that as an internal tool. They also mentioned the idea of having individuals be in situations that are similar to that of sport. Do you think there's a time and place for real time HRV feedback and HRV training? And would you possibly put someone in a situation where they're trying to score that goal or maybe you fatigue them with, say, a sled push or a prowler push and then you have their HRV tank? And they have to perform a difficult technical task in an attempt to have them auto regulate that HRV so they can perform that task successfully, making training and skill development much more specific and beginning to mesh together. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's biofeedback 101, right? That's that's uh, thought technology, heart math, all those companies out there using that with performance psychologists uh, to see how people a handle the stressors implied on them, but how do they bounce back? So the, the military has been doing this for, for years and, and live monitoring HRV on, on some of the, the operators and then watching them perform you know, their, their training, going through selection and training phases where they have to um, handle extremely dynamic and challenging environments where they're under watch. They're being scrutinized every step of the way. And so what we've actually seen is that people who on average, you know, it's not there's anomalies, of course. People who take the hit, right? So you'll see a drop in HRV or an uh, increase in sympathetic tone. They will actually bounce back though. So having a stressor impact your, your, your body is, is normal, but the ability to rebound and kind of come back to those norms within a relatively quick period of time is what 
is critical for high performance. Um, I, you know, they talked about having a five minute or a 300 beat average prior to uh, that activity to get a baseline. Uh, what we found and some of the research is coming out now, you can actually probably cut it down to one to three minutes, right? So it becomes much more, I guess, logistically feasible to have guys sit around for one to three minutes, kind of collect that quote unquote baseline and then go about their day. And, and that's really critical to get that, that daily baseline because as we talked about, if you're on day six of a, a long week, your body is functioning and flowing uh, in kind of repair mode. It's trying to keep up with what you've been putting it through. So each day that you wake up, you are gonna be slightly different than what you were before. So it's, it's not an apples to apples. You gotta look at your ability to flux um, and that allostatic load and your body's uh, proactive uh, decision-making to try and match what it was doing in the prior days to that training evolution. Gotcha. So HRV itself, I refer to as a check engine light because it doesn't necessarily come from one area. It can come from emotional and you can stub your toe, you can have a lower HRV. And some of the things I've been reading about lately and talking to you about off this podcast over text message and kindly enough, you respond to my uh, random texts at 930 at night with a slew of articles and 10 questions has been the nutritional yeah. side. Right. And, and the idea of low level systemic inflammation or inadequate nutrition. What I mean by that is that we're putting food into our body under the assumption that this is going to give us a positive effect. But really, sometimes the foods that we put into our body are causing a stressor on our system because either A, they're so foreign to us in regards to the way they're processed, or B, the simple sugars in them, and I mean simple in terms of you're eating a Fruit Loop, have an effect on our body that can take us down a road that necessarily isn't positive for adaptation. And just like HRV is affected by your psychological perception, I've been reading a little bit about how HRV is a kind of a systemic monitor and how it can be influenced by nutrition. Um, in regards to that nutritional aspect, I know we've talked a little bit about biomarkers and yep. some of the diving deep into internal medicine and understanding that our body is very complex. It's made up of all these subsystems and how one subsystem acts might affect how another subsystem acts. And as we gain these risk factors of inadequate nutrient status, our overall risk profile increases. And the idea that we might have an emergent pattern in terms of an illness manifest increases. So I want to hear some of your thoughts on some of the internal medicine, where that's going um, in regards to biomarkers for athletics, human performance, and just general wellness. I know you're not a physician and you're not ordering blood work and diagnosing off blood work, but being a sports scientist, I do think it's important to appreciate and understand some of these concepts. And you have a great in-depth knowledge in this area, so I'd love to hear a little more about it. Yeah, no, I think that's an area, and by no means am I an expert, right? I, I, I just read a lot of things and, and copy what other people say, so I, I have to always say that, uh, you know, that's what we always kind of hang our hat on, is that if you go through the research, you're basically taking somebody else's thoughts, interpreting them to your own. So my experiences with this are personal and what I've seen in the professional setting, and I'll kind of touch on the personal piece because I think you know, as we talked about being an athlete and, and understanding what people go through, our own experiences can drive a lot of how we make decisions with our athletes or our you know, clients or whoever we're working with. And that basically for 25 years of my life, I've been on some form of allergy medicine, allergy shot, decongestant, uh, Z-Pack to get rid of a sinus infection, you name it, I, I, had, I had it. And I had multiple sinus infections for every year. And not one time I went to ear, nose, and throat doctors. I went to, you know, allergy specialists. Not one time did never, anyone ever bring up, what are you putting in your body? And, uh, you know, it took, you know, I, I went to a Dr. Jim Laval seminar last summer, and it took uh, somebody, well, he's very good, but it took somebody to kind of like say, hey, man, like, you know, it's not just um, isolating the symptom and giving you an antihistamine or, or something like that. You got to think that you're in a systemic state of inadequacy. Your body doesn't have the ability to recognize normal nutrients um, as you eat things, but then also it doesn't have the ability to, to recognize um, some of the, I guess, the things that are supposed to be normal now become pathological and it's just a complete dysfunctional cycle. And so for me, 
I literally just, he said, Hey, do me a favor. Stop eating dairy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I love cheese, but we'll, we'll do that. And I literally, within three to four days, every single allergy symptom I had went away. I haven't had any issues for seven and a half months. I haven't wow. taken a single thing. I haven't had any issues. I haven't gotten sick once. And it was just one thing. I come to find out I have a lactose allergy. And not only does it, did it affect me like with GI distress, but it affects chronic states of allergies. So my body was perceiving things as uh, the enemy and the immune system was essentially creating that inflammatory response to deal with them. Um, so I think that first and foremost, I started just looking at Maybe people are eating things that they may have a low-grade inflammatory response to. Um, I was taking NSAIDs. I was taking NSAIDs like they were candy since I was 16 years old. You know, being an athlete, you get off home off practice, your knees hurt, your ankle hurts, whatever happens. You know, you just take them so that you can, um, you know, keep on going to, to practice the next day. Um, I was taking z packs I was taking prednisone. All these things basically put my body in a state of in a state of shock to a point where it couldn't actually regulate normal immune function. Um, and so to kind of take that into my my work and, and professional environment, and we have athletes who are under that significant academic stress, social stress, and then physical stress. What we also see is they're just like me, and then they were taking NSAIDs. They were taking you know, prednisone, they were taking corticosteroids for asthma, exercise-induced asthma. They were taking all these things that basically is driving the body into a state of alarm where it doesn't have a normalcy to it. So we're not seeing the immune system actually do its job. We're seeing um, a chronic sympathetic response basically to everything that's being put into the body. And so with that low-grade inflammation that's happening over weeks, months, years, you get that inability to handle external loads. Then that's where that internal load becomes so critical. But what we're once is maybe a resilient person. Now they're getting the sniffles every three weeks. Now they're they're walking around with some type of telfemoral tendonitis. Uh, and I think that we so easily look at, oh, they landed on it funny in practice. Oh, they they took a bump or a bruise from somebody. But maybe that is exacerbated, or maybe that's highly sensitive due to the fact that. The body isn't able to function under normal circumstances. No, that's, <laughs> there's a lot of topics in that I want to dive into. Um, I guess one of those immediate topics that's most applicable for individuals is the idea of NSAIDs and how, I mean, when I was in uh, middle school, I must have taken maybe six, four or five before a game when I was playing and it felt nothing of it. Um, I can only imagine what that's doing to my internal, you know, my, my stomach and my gastric system and how much it's chewed up. There's actually been a lot of information that's come out regarding tendon healing and yep. the adaptations of it. Um, and you've talked, you were, I think, the first one to bring this to my attention um, and some of the detriments of NSAID itself and some of the alternatives we could possibly have, such as curcumin and things that don't necessarily tear our system up. Um, if you have any thoughts on that and how that might play a role, then okay, we have this functional medicine world. Now, how do we apply that into you know, physical therapy? And if we're trying to have tendon adaptations in regards to isometrics, we might be doing them to increase longevity and reduce tendinopathy. Or if we're filling someone up with NSAIDs, are we really getting the bang for the buck that we want to get? Or are we just causing more harm than good? Yeah, absolutely. I think you, know, you said it right there and that are you taking that risk reward on using that, I guess, short term uh, you know, that pill to, um, is it overriding what you truly want in the long term? Okay, so we talked about adaptation, you mentioned it. Well, we've seen that NSAIDs actually have um, a destruction of satellite cells. So when you're normally building muscle, and you're having some of these repair cells come in to help stimulate um, regeneration, NSAIDs will actually blunt that response. So COX1 and 2, uh, being the primary enzymes associated with that will actually get shut down. Uh, and when they do, you're literally stopping your body from adapting and growing. So I talk to my, my soccer team all the time about it. I'm like, guys, if you guys are, you want, you're wearing those sleeveless shirts, you want to fill those things out. Let's not take away from uh, what already isn't there, you know? And uh, I think, you know, when we start looking at, as you mentioned it, healing in that early stage return to play and 
Now, I'm never going to say, hey, you know, you shouldn't do that. That's always up to the doctors and the medical professionals. But I think that there's lack of thought for, for long-term uh, maladaptation. So you mentioned it. Do we alter collagen proliferation um, for the expense of just taking down some swelling and, and irritation? Uh, maybe that pain, pers- pain response can be better handled by Tylenol or, or, or whatever else somebody thinks. Um, because I think it, it's critical, especially, you know, you see the two different primary types of collagen and type one and type three, um, they've seen that there is a, a blunted response and how that tendon regenerates. And so I think, you know, little things like that, those conversations you have with your athletic trainer or, you know, your doctor and be like, Hey, is this absolutely necessary? Like, I'm not questioning your, your rationale, but does this athlete need that? Or is there something else we can do mm-hmm. that's going to make sure that when I am doing BFR or whatever, or BFR ISOs to maximize uh, tendon thickness or tendon restructuring or, or whatever I'm doing, are we going to throw a baby out with the bathwater? Are we going to hurt something, you know, for the expense of, you know, what's easy and what we know from a Western medical model? Yeah, that's very interesting. And one of the things, by the way, I want to clarify for those not familiar with terminology. NSAIDs are non, sorry, Chase, I'll let you go ahead. Then interrupt you real quick. Um, yeah. NSAIDs are things like ibuprofen and Advil. Um, non-steroidal, anti-inflammatory. Um, what's the D stand for? I'm forgetting right now. I feel Drugs. stupid now. Drugs. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Um, things like ibuprofen and um, Advil. I used to take you know, like six Advils before I played basketball because when it came out, I knew no better. It made my knee feel better and take more the merrier. But again, it's coming out that we're really tearing up our system. But what's interesting is when you look at some of the inflammation studies, you look at older adults, it brings up the idea that as we age, we get in such an inflammatory state. We're taking things like NSAIDs, which are known to possibly reduce adaptations in individuals who are healthy. It actually increases muscle growth in some of those older adults because their level of inflammation is so high systemically that taking something as like an NSAID or Advil, which we think is bad, actually increases adaptation. And they just showed, I just read a paper probably 30 minutes before this that showed curcumin um, has the potential effects to do the same, which might be a healthier alternative to NSAIDs in regards to reducing inflammation. And one topic I wanna get onto that you mentioned it up and you opened the can of worms on this, so I blame you is blood flow restriction training. Um, You called it BFR. And for anyone listening, Chase is one of the most well-versed individuals in this area. I I learned from him probably weekly on it. And I get studies from him. Um, It used to be daily, probably a little less consistent now because he's probably realizing that I can't read that fast. But I'm going to Chase to talk a little bit about some of the protocols that you use BFR and um, how you can use it for not just athletic development, but for individuals who might just be seeking an alternative way to work out, whether it be older adults, people who travel on the road, and what it does physiologically for not only muscle growth, but the tendon thickness, like you said, and some of the other, other protocols, such as cellular swelling protocols. Yeah, yeah I think you know, the, the one thing I would say about <clears throat> our previous uh, conversation with the NSAIDs thing is I'm not telling people not to take them. I'm not like running around saying that that's the, the <laughs> devil and all that. So I, like, I, I make sure that I'm not like one of those zealots about that stuff. It's, it's just, Hey, do you need it? You know, like just that thought process is critical. Is this necessary? Not let me just pop them because I'm sore today. Right. I think that's the, the caveat I want people to, to walk away with is that everything is necessary if it's necessary. And if it's not, is there a better alternative or is it just part of life? Is that part of being a division one athlete or, you know, somebody who's recreationally fit is you're going to feel a little sore and tired. Is it necessary to take that pill that may negatively affect you? So I think that's one thing I wanted to say, but uh, kind of moving on to the, the BFR. You are not a Z-Lot. I will, I will vouch yeah. for it. Yeah. It's uh, just an no. interesting topic to talk about. And I give you credit for being open-minded on both ends. So yeah. So, <laughs> if so anyone think, was concerned. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to throw that out there. Um, but I think with the BFR stuff, it's <clears throat> so I, I've learned a lot from the, a man, Dr. Ed Lacera. Uh, he works with the Smart Tools Company, which they're just absolutely revolutionizing uh, how available and the education that's associated with blood flow restriction. So I 
you know, I, I I'm going to kind of pass on that credit and say that um, they're really pushing the field forward. And, and I'm not affiliated with the company. I just think what they're doing is, is fantastic work because blood flow restriction obviously has been around for a long time. It's not new. Uh, you know, we're not pretending it's new, but, you know, it's really the availability of, of cuffs for affordable affordable prices has, has made it seem, you know, refreshed and kind of a new life to it. Um, started in the late 90s, uh, you know, Japan really doing a lot of the early research on it. Uh, a lot of people started with tying off with different straps and and uh, bands that they're just wrapping around their arms and, and looking for, you know, in a partial occlusion, in some cases, probably dangerously at, at full ischemia. Um, but I think uh, you saw it in, in most recent years with some of the Owens recovery and the Delphi's, uh, which come at a pretty pretty high price tag. And um, as I mentioned, uh, Smart Tools has come out. They have much more affordable. I think it's you know a tenth of the price. And so now you're able to put these types of you know this tool in, in everybody's hands. And I think it's it's changing the the landscape as far as uh, a modality that has multiple. Um, uses. And, I, and that's one thing when we talk sports science, we talk technology, you know, everything uh, has a time and place. But when I look and evaluate and vet out technology or whatever we're going to bring on as a, as a new resource, I always look for it to have multiple uses. Does it have a bang for your buck? Um, and I think the blood flow restriction does. It's versatile. It can be used in rehab. It can be used to build muscle. It can be used for strength. It can be used as a, an activity potentiator. So you can use it to potentially uh, increase your subsequent performance uh, with an acute time window. Uh, you can use it as a recovery tool. So I think the, the the utilization of it is still, we're learning about it. There's still no definitive, here's how this happens in this sequence. Um, but I think that's with everything, right? The human body, we're learning so much about it. Um, but the science that's there um, has proven that low load with blood flow restriction, where we were including 100% venous return, but partially including arterial inflow. So there is blood flow going into the muscles and the periphery, but there is no blood flow returning. And so it creates a pooling effect where essentially you're going to limit the availability of oxygen. You're going to decrease the pH, become more acidic. You're going to deplete phosphocreatine stores. You're essentially going to run through the size principle and use up small. Uh, slow twitch fibers and skip essentially right to fast twitch fibers with a low load or even a non-loaded exercise. So I think when you talk about somebody who's got limitations, maybe they just had surgery, they can't run, they can't uh, have the impulse or the impact that you would need or you would want to see to um, kind of develop the musculature as they come back. Blood flow restriction is a great way because it takes a low load exercise and utilizes uh, that restricted pooling, and you get a uh, subsequent fast twitch uh, adaptation. So you're you're stimulating the, the the big boys, the ones that move us, the ones that make us jump and run faster. Uh, and I think you're seeing time windows of adaptation that are a sixth of the time faster. You're getting strength and hypertrophy adaptation in two weeks, whereas in traditional resistance training, it was taking eight to twelve. Um, so and when you talk about I had a, an athlete roll their ankle and I want to make sure that they're not having atrophy as they walk around in a boot. I need to make sure that the muscles around the knees and, and the hamstrings, the VMO, the VL, all those critical um, drivers in, in sport aren't just wasting away. So we would have athletes obviously in the rehab setting doing protocols to develop muscle, but also just sitting. The, the act of just sitting with occlusion passively, not doing anything, has been shown to cut atrophy by 50%. So wow. it's fantastic because it's non-invasive. You're not doing anything to them. They're just sitting. So uh, we don't you know, promote them to play on their phones constantly, but they can sit there and have their phone out and you know, 20 minutes goes by and they just hopefully um, you know, benefited their, their return to play in a you know, faster, more efficient way than just sitting around. So. Lots of lots of utility for it. Interesting. So for those not familiar, blood flow restriction training, the way it works, you get a cuff. Um, hopefully a cuff, not just uh, an elastic band you're tying on, but that's how it started. 
originally from Katsu training out in Japan. So it's a cuff that attaches proximally on the limb, typically up by the shoulder or up along the thigh. And it occludes the amount of blood, so reduces the amount of blood go, go into the muscle, which then allows these series of physiological effects that Chase alluded to. Now, there's a difference between venous and arterial occlusion. And Chase, in regards to that, um, what are some of the specifics of it for people who aren't as familiar with blood flow? You rattle off a bunch of stuff regarding blood flow and some of the adaptations of it, but people who aren't familiar with it, you measure the occlusion through Doppler. And I believe Smart Tools uses a remote Doppler that yep. you're attached Perfect. to on the distal limb. And, and re when using this, what percentages do you use? How do you know what per is it too much occlusion? Is it too tight? Is it not tight enough? And then what are the protocols that you use once you have the right occlusion for that limb? to increase some of these hypertrophy, some muscle growing activities, um, or you know, just sitting there playing on your phone activities that reduces hypertrophy for your athletes. Yeah, um, so what you're doing is you're actually gonna take an external Doppler or something that's gonna allow you to magnify the sound of the, the pulse, right? So if you take radial pulse you know, right here, you would place the Doppler on it and you would actually be able to hear the heartbeat um, as it, pumps through, just doosh, doosh, doosh. And up top, they're wearing the cuff. You're gonna slowly start to inflate it. It gets tighter, tighter, tighter. And you will eventually get to a point where that, uh, that pulse will start to fade of doosh, doosh, doosh. And it comes to a point where you, it's non-existent. And so that's when you know that there's been full arterial occlusion. That's their 100%. There is no blood flow into that arm. There's no blood flow out. It is occluded. And so research has shown that basically anywhere from 30% to 90%, you're going to have the same amount of occlusion. So if I was to explain that um, a little bit more detail is, so I'm going to take that 100% occlusion number. So if you've ever done your blood pressure and the typical one of perfect blood pressure is 120 over 80, and that's the same device we're going to use. I mean, it's, it's a sphygma monomometer, the tough one to say. Um, and you're going to get a number up there, like, let's just say 250. All right. So that's your hundred percent occlusion. What again, research has shown is that in 30% of 250, all the way up to 90% of 250, that's the sweet spot for occluding arterial that actually doesn't improve occlusion as the higher you go. So, uh, we stick to 50%. So, you know, 50% of 250 is, um, 125. And um, you're going to have just as much as if you did it at 90%. And really the difference is, is pain perception. Because if you start getting up to 100% occlusion and telling somebody to exercise, they're not going to like it. It's not going to feel good. So it's a, it's a nice sweet spot of saying, hey, we have the occluded arterial, uh, but not fully restricted. But we have restricted venous, but we can still move and be active. Um, and so with that, what you're really looking to do, there's a 30, 15, 15, 15 protocol that's uh, seen pretty commonly, but ultimately you just need to fatigue the muscles. You need to have a low load exercise that's done for high volume, uh, typically 15 plus reps for multiple sets with a minimal rest period. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, allow for blood to be uh, pumped into the muscle. You're going to actively you know, contract over time. It's going to stimulate fast switch uh, fibers. You're going to rest for a very short period. More blood flow is going to go to the area. It's going to keep getting more acidic. It's going to keep um, activating more fast twitch. And you're going to just repeat that. And so, uh, I mean, it really, really magnifies uh, the response of typically a weight or a resistance that would be almost no impact on you at all. You would have no performance benefit from using a weight that light. So you can really use it as you know, in a, in a rehab setting with an athlete who has very little capability to handle load, or you could use it as a finisher and you're a bodybuilder and you want to stimulate a, a muscle group that's lagging and you really want to build it up. Uh, and, and it's the, the fantastic thing I think about it is it's a minimally damaging activity. And what I mean by that is that you're going to have uh, a dramatic reduction in creatine stores, so CK levels, myoglobin, you're not going to get the same mechanical breakdown that you see with typical resistance training. So when we start talking about internal load and HRV, 
if you were to substitute an in-season lift um, with BFR, you're still going to get strength and, and hypertrophy adaptation without the potential uh, systemic load that maybe a typical resistance training session does. So now you start talking about minimizing uh, internal responses, but still getting adaptation. So it, it's it's pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, that's that's something. So I've seen personally as well. I use smart tools. Smart tools. I'm not affiliated with. I'm a big fan of them because they made it affordable for individuals like you and myself to actually use them. Yeah. So when we're talking about occlusion, we're talking about reducing the amount of arterial occlusion, um, but not the amount of venous occlusion. So you're allowing blood to pool to an extent. Um, you get large amounts of dilation. You increase the amount of capillaries in that area, but you're also not breaking down the muscle in the same way that you would otherwise. So when you're lifting a heavy load, you have the fibers themselves begin to essentially tear apart and your body has to rebuild these. But now we're increasing hypertrophy, so growing the muscle without having to have this breakdown response in the muscle itself. But with that being said, the loads that you're using are also 20% of your one rep max. So a very, very light load you're using to fatigue how does that affect the tendon itself? Because one thing I've noticed personally, and this is, I'm not, I'm not saying you should do this, okay? This is what I did, and it's maybe stupid or whatever you want to call it. I had a really bad tendinopathy issue in my knee where I couldn't play basketball. I couldn't go upstairs well. And I did BFR, traditional training where I had tempo work. But when I started doing BFR low-level plyometrics, when I started inducing some of those shearing forces on the tendon, to increase adaptation in that area that otherwise might not be there with a low load, I started to see much better results in my knee compared to some of the tempo work. Now, do you do anything specifically with BFR that might target the tendon outside of the traditional 30 reps, 15 reps, 15 reps, 15 reps with a low load? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, some of the, the isometrics that we talked about when you were working at Stanford and having that analgesic effect. So having the ability to have pain mitigation uh, in acute windows of what, 15 to 45 minutes, um, but also the collagen proliferation. So you're getting uh, an increase in human growth uh, hormone that is like 170% times greater after uh, a workout, which we know HGH doesn't necessarily build bigger muscles, but it does stimulate collagen growth. So when you're having somebody who is maybe coming back from a ruptured Achilles or uh, another, you know, itis or osis issue, you know, it's a great way to help promote an environment and maybe an avascular area. And, and it kind of forces nutrients and a uh, hormonal shift that may promote a more um, healing environment. Uh, I think, you know, we, we talked about uh, briefly the, the training piece. I think, you know, the more that you can start to get people into, I'm not, I, overly dramatic sports specific person but i think the more you can get people into activities that are going to be uh, replicated on the field you know whether it's sled pushes and walks or whether it's you know having some type of um you know uh activity if you're a pitcher where you're you're getting your arm through these ranges of motions that are going to be necessary while using the inclusion is actually going to promote a lot of um, ongoing benefit i think to to rehabilitate the area uh, in a functional manner and, and develop not only the musculature, but also promote um, the properties around that specific tissue that needs to be healed. So I think there's, there's some really cool things that are just now kind of being played with just because we can actually dial in the proper occlusions. We can actually dial in um, what we want to see happen with you, whether it's uh, some of the cell soil protocols that we're, we're doing or this ischemic preconditioning protocols where we're having athletes sit for an extended period of time passively with their occlusion uh, set, and then they're gonna reperfuse, we're gonna allow blood flow back in, and we're gonna do that at repeated intervals prior to activity and see uh, potential for increased power output, uh, oxygen kinetics. Uh, the research is, is pretty amazing with some of the ischemic preconditioning and that they're seeing um, increase time to exhaustion, decrease time trial performances, um, but they don't really know why. You know, there isn't like a, a clear mechanism for performance gain um, that's been totally identified just yet. There has been stuff where it's shown to attenuate lactate levels 
So you obviously know cellular respiration is enhanced because you're not getting that amount of hydrogen present in the blood. So you may be potentially a more efficient energy user using more, more fat and, and oxygen. So that's great there. But I think, uh, you know, as the research starts catching up, that piece is that's one thing that I'm looking at doing for my, uh, my research focus for school is that potentiation piece. If I'm already going to be sitting around before a game or if I'm going to have time between events like a track and field event or a you know, pool event, and I know I can sit here passively, not use energy, provide a stimulus to the body that's going to potentially open up uh, neural pathways or uh, physiological mechanisms to increase contractibility of the muscles, I'm going to then maybe get that extra tenth uh, of a second. I'm going to throw an extra you know, a couple feet on the javelin, I'm going to do whatever I need to do, uh, potentially at a higher level. And I think that's really, as we're pushing towards performance, why do you take, uh, you know, choose during the game? Like you want to increase performance, you want to run longer. And I think this is going to add one more little layer to it that from an investment piece is minimally invasive, is minimally um, changing to their, to their schedule. They're not, they don't have to do anything crazy. They feel good. I think that's the biggest thing is the anecdotal feedback on it is man i feel great i feel like i have to uh i don't have to do a full warm-up i feel like i can just kind of get out there move around we still have them do stuff but they just feel like they've warmed up faster and i think uh that piece is going to be really cool to see if we can demonstrate some uh, empirical evidence on it yeah no that i'm excited to see the research and uh, i know you're working hard on it it's kind of a great topic you brought up it kind of really brings us full circle because you look at bfr it increases the acidity in the area and lactate production. It increases autonomic nervous system arousal, which has been shown both to increase cognitive abilities, um, neuroplasticity, and the ability to enhance memory. And so while you're doing this, it's also not only priming the body for the upcoming activity, but you're also priming the body as a whole in regards to its mental capacity and not just the muscular area. And so when you start looking at that, you know, full system of the human body and how we kind of talked about a little bit here, some dynamical systems where, you know, the body is really complex and what happens in one area affects another, but right? you can't differentiate between your physical and mental side because the physical right. side of BFR is now enhancing your mental side, just like your perception can enhance a workout. And so you right. have feedback up and feedback back down. And that's yeah. just a great, you know, highlight you brought up because now it's really inclusive where we're so often thinking in this isolated manner oh, if we bench this or if we run this, this will happen. But we don't think about it in this recursive loop manner where what I do to my muscle, right, our muscle releases these myokines that go talk to our brain, which then go back and talk to our muscle. And we have the endocrine system working together to orchestrate this all. And just the whole idea of BFR before a game, it's not just, right, the muscles and the ischemic preconditioning, but it's also the fact that you're putting the person in a state that's more conducive to performance itself because so often and this isn't to go on a rant and i apologize and this is something you and i have talked about right we're not avoiding the sympathetic state right we don't want to be sitting there before a game doing deep belly breathing because we need to be ready to roll yep. there's a reason why you get excited in these situations and it's just a really excellent full loop example of how it all kind of comes together there yeah i, th I think one last little piece with that too is Lactate has been shown in exercise, uh, but specific lactate now too, has been associated with BDNF, right? So that brain-derived neurotropic factor that uh, exercise stimulates kind of like miracle growth for the brain. And that if you're sitting around watching, you know, a lecture for an hour, get up, do 10 squats, walk around, and all of a sudden you have a renewed focus. And so with that, to your point of it's all connected is you have an athlete who potentially is going to get a benefit from that. But we're also, you know, and, and they'll never watch this, so I'll say it, um, is I'm, I'm, I'm implanting that placebo. You know, my verbiage is really, really careful. And hey, just so you know, you wear this 10, 10, 15 minutes before you do some ISOs, your ankle will feel better. It has an ability to mitigate pain. Like I'm implanting that sense of this is going to work because placebo effect works. We know it does. So there's a little bit of, you know, mix of art and science and, and how we imply these technologies and saying, hey, like, hey, Logan, just so you know, you wear this before that game, your ankle will feel better. You're going to feel looser. You're going to feel faster. And just letting them roll with that. And don't need to tell them anything else. 
And I think that to your point of it's all connected can then maximize um, whatever intervention you want to then increase performance. Yeah, and I, I'll avoid a rant here. I'll keep it short, I promise. But what you hit on is perfect, especially in the sense that look at some of the studies regarding attendance. They'll look at it and see that the tendon itself is healthy, yet they feel pain. And they've done a lot of studies where they're saying an external stimulus. So something like a metronome in the background going ping, ping, ping. And you're focused on the stimulus instead of the pain. And you now begin to deassociate your knee with pain because the stimulus in regards to the tempo that's going on in the background, you're doing it while you're doing an exercise. So now because you're focused on this external stimulus while during exercise, you begin to disassociate pain with your, you know, knee or tendon during that movement and it just really shows how coupled the system is and how our brain talks to our body body and if we perceive that we're healthy right you said oh mixing the art and the science well you're mixing the science and the science right you're you understand that perception is reality and it's not necessarily we like to call it art because there's no number to put behind it but really it's you know the science that our body is deeply interconnected and that how our neurons from the brain talk to our muscles, how our muscles talk back to our brain, are all essentially one. And how everything from your nutrition to your perception to your, your stress from school, your emotional um, state, whether you got a text message from someone that made you upset, all affects your internal load of the body itself. And regardless of what external load we put, and no matter how hard you want to work, if your internal system isn't able to handle the stimulus you're going to put on it in terms of the load you're going to give, then what we're doing is it's really falling short of what we're actually trying to accomplish because we're essentially using external load to infer what's going on. But there's so many things that go on inside the body outside of external load that if we're only using one system to monitor the internal system, we're kind of, I don't want to say falling short, but not maybe doing all that we can do. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, not to, to rant myself, but that's one of the biggest mistakes that we as SSC practitioners make is the assumption uh, with general adaptation syndrome theory that you're getting people and that they're adapting at the rate and to the dose that you think is appropriate, that we're making that assumption as to where they're at. So when we say, oh, they're in homeostasis and we're going to apply two weeks of a, a loading scheme and then we're going to unload and then we're going to push it higher because they're going to super compensate. I think that is a load of crap. I think that we want that to be the case because we want to feel justified and feel good at what we do. But in many cases, you really have to dial in all the factors associated with overreaching, all the factors associated with performance and mix them and have checks and balances to see truly if somebody is where you think they are and if you got them to where they are. And if not, what was the reason why? Was there an energy insufficiency? Was there a micronutrient problem? Was there associated stress damaging the functioning of the HPA axis? All those things have, you know, they come into play, but we are so rigid and, and a lot of our thinking, me included, I'm totally guilty of this. We work in four to six week blocks. Oh yeah, my, you know, my unload is going to be at th week three. Well, maybe your own unload should be at week nine. You know, like how do you know that they're not ready for more and more and more? Um, you know, so that I think that assumption of not necessarily taking into consideration that connectedness between all these systems um, can get us into trouble. It can make us have false positives. I think. I think we really can grasp onto stuff that's that's not there. No, that's 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 couldn't be said better because we like to make it simple because we can understand simple, and when we make it complex, we realize we don't really understand that much. But the more we appreciate that's complex, the more we can appreciate how applying something simple, like we think a load, 10 push-ups, really isn't as simple as it may be. And that at times can cause paralysis by analysis, where you have so many things going on at once and to consider. I'm not saying that we need to sit there and measure every single subsystem. And I know you're not either. But the idea that we need to appreciate that and see where can we maybe refer to, turn to, that isn't just in the lane of how much weight do we lift and how much load do we give someone, but what other factors could be involved in that athlete's life that's not giving the results 
that we think this external load should be leading to. And it's a great check engine light because now we have this external load. Hey, I expect you to be here in three months and you're not there. That's okay. Because who knows whose fault it is, it's no one's. But the idea is that now we can turn to different people because we didn't see the expected results. We can dive a little deeper and that's allowing us to utilize our resources, whether it's a friend you know, a doctor you know, another practitioner you know, to help arm us with the information to be the best that we can be. Yeah, I think that's where the external load comes in, right? You got to know if they're not meeting the expectations or the, mm -hmm. the desired outcomes. You know, are, are they typically uh, matching people in practice, you know, that are uh, similar positional demands? Are they typically being asked to do something that isn't looking normal uh, that then we can kind of backtrack and see how they were doing it, what the factors associated with that internal load were? Um, and again, I, I, we don't we don't monitor everything. We don't think it's necessary. We try and find what's appropriate for each team and uh, scenario. But I think, again, if you're mindful and you know your athletes and you know the scenario of what you're trying to put them in, you can then kind of use your, your coaching eye to say, okay, what are the things that I think may be influencing or, or providing maladaptation, you know, towards uh, the desired stimulus, you know, or the desired outcome? Now, what are we doing uh, to them that we should be seeing or think we should be seeing? And if I know them, what is potentially a confounding variable to that? Yeah, no, that's perfect. You, you don't assess everything, A, because you can't, and B, no one has time. But you assess what's pertinent, and you're aware of what's pertinent. And you act as a check engine light and facilitate where you can. Um, yeah. that's, that's well said because I think both ends we say, oh, let's be so simple and just do this, or let's only do this aspect over here. But to, when you take in consideration all of it, you allow yourself to be the best you can be in your position that you're in because you're not trying to solve everything. You're just trying to facilitate where you can. Um, yeah, that's perfect. Well, Chase, I don't want to hold you up too long, and I really appreciate you being here. Um, I want to wrap it up, but before we finish it up here, I got, I guess, two questions for you. Okay. And I didn't send them to you ahead of time. So mm -hmm. they're kind of, <laughs> if you don't have a quick answer, that's fine. The first one is, it's pretty simple. Um, I'm not going to, I don't mean resources in terms of, oh, go to PubMed or go to uh, this paper, but are there any individuals out there that you can possibly listen to or find that you have found to be very informative and not just in terms of, oh, that's good information. But something that's changed the way you think about how you do your job. Yeah, I'm talking to you right now. Uh, you definitely <laughs> uh, challenged a lot of my my thoughts and and you know how I address uh, you know some of the the biomechanics and physics of what we're doing. I, you know, it's definitely not an area that I'm strong in, and and I think you've done a great job of putting information out there for the public to to you know be able to digest in an easy manner. Um, Man, you know, a public resource, uh, you know, this may sound kind of cheesy and, and maybe a little bit of bro sciencey, but I still read T Nation and, and go to like all those, you know, you know, Jim Wendler sites and, and read all the West Side stuff. And, you know, I think you can't isolate sports science and say, oh, it's just data or oh, it's just, you know, pumping out uh, research out of a lab or oh, it's physiology or, or it's technology. I think each practitioner is going to have their own flavor and what they like and what they bring to the table. And I think that we need to cater to that. Each person should say, Hey, this is what I'm good at. These are my skills. I want to learn more about X. And if X uh, so happens to be baseball and throwing and overhead athletes, then you know, you're going to find the Mike Reinholds, the Eric Cressies and, and really dive into that. And if you want to know about traditional periodization schemes and force plates, you're going to look at the stone stuff. You're going to look at half. You're going to look at, people who were you know, early pioneers in it. So I think, you know, I don't have a, a necessarily a, a one person to go follow, but it's more of a, a question to the question is, what do you want to know about? What do you like? What's something that's really, really, you know, kind of hits the button for you. And then just start Googling stuff, start, you know, typing these, these keywords in and people will start popping up. And I think that's my development has come, uh, has jumped the greatest, I guess, leaps is when I started diving into these rabbit holes of what do I want to learn about right now? And just saying for the next two weeks, I'm going all in on, you know, let's see, saturation of muscle, muscle oxygen, SMO2. You know, I'm just going to learn everything I can about 
myoglobin and hemoglobin and hematocrit and, and all that stuff. So it's really more about finding what you want to know at that time and just doing a deep dive and then finding something else and doing a deep dive. And before you know it, you times years to that and you have a, you know, a well-rounded, uh, hopefully, you know, base of, of knowledge to pull from. And my last question for you, Chase, and this might be a tough one for you to answer, being that you are the ghost of social media. <laughs> yeah, the, the king of the king of trolling my page. Yeah, um, people love it. are interested. <laughs> if people are interested in following up on what you're doing, where can they find more information about yourself? Um, what links or handles, either Twitter, Instagram, would you advise them to look up into and uh, keep a tab on yourself? So the only thing I'm using is I have an Instagram at, at underscore Chase Phelps. So it's it's simple. It's I like to I like to troll you and 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 <laughs> pipe in every now and then. But uh, that's basically what I got. I got a couple posts up there. But maybe maybe if uh, I get a little help, we'll see how it uh, how it grows. Yeah, I, I highly advise you guys following him because we can need to push him to post more stuff. I shouldn't be the only one privileged to get his text messages at obscure hours, uh, highlighting some interesting topics. Uh, I would love for it to be shared publicly so I'm not being the, the third party siphoning off his knowledge and posting it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chase. I really appreciate you uh, hanging in here and being able to be our first guest. Um, again, you're, the reason why I wanted you on first, you quite a bit played a big role in my development and continue to, and we all wish the best for you. Um, it really was uh, great to have you here, and thank you. All right, man. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for listening. Again, uh, my handle here is strong. Sorry, at strong underscore by science. Oh, I did that all wrong. It's at strong underscore by underscore science. I should know my own handle by now if I use Instagram. I think my Twitter's handles at strong underscore science. Who knows? Uh, we'll make a link to it. Uh, we'll be sharing this podcast here shortly with different clips as well. For those of you who don't have the attention span to listen to an hour, 20 minute podcast, we'll dice some of this up. So thank you guys for listening. Really appreciate it. And uh, take care.